All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the next edition of our Inside Edge live industry panels. We're coming at you from the interwebs today because, you know, it was a little bit of a bummer this year. We didn't get to see everybody in Florida. Usually Orlando is such a huge week for us, not only in terms of the amount of equipment we sell, but also just, just a chance to to be with everybody and meet with everybody. And, you know, as I think, gosh, we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in Europe now. I was in Europe a year ago this time, wondering if I could get back to the United States. I'm wondering the same thing again, if I can get back to the United States. So it's been a, just been a crazy 12 months, whether it's masks, whether it's toilet paper, whether it's an election, whether it's vaccine. You know, we we have we I think we've I think we've seen it all. Uh, uh, maybe not, but you know, I hope we've seen it all. And you know, the the amazing thing is through all of this, right? This industry, you know, the heavy equipment industry has has persisted, right? We kept on building stuff. We kept on growing and harvesting stuff. And today we're going to talk about how we kept on delivering stuff. And to do that, we've got uh, an amazing panel today. Uh, I want to introduce them. First and foremost, my name is Matt Ackley. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Ritchie Brothers today, and I'm going to be your MC. And then we've got just these, these four good-looking folks here who are going to give us some insights on the trucking space. And let's turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Why don't we start with Steve? And then go to Rob, Tyler, and Don. Just give us a brief um, overview of you know what you've been up to lately. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks to Richie Brothers for the opportunity for ACT Research to uh, to participate in the panel. My name's Steve Tam. I'm a vice president with ACT Research. Started with the company back in uh, 2000, but I actually got my uh, start in the industry back in '93 at Cummins. So. Lately, what have I been doing? <laughs> Try, trying to figure this crazy market out. Uh, there's just so much going on. There are so many dynamics and so many unknowns. Uh, so I've been spending an awful lot of time uh, thinking, which is kind of kind of what we do and what we get paid to do. So let's let's leave it at that and and uh, maybe move on to to Rob to tell us about what's going on with him. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Rob Slavin, Senior Valuations Analyst uh, for Ritchie Brothers. I've been in the transportation industry for about 29 years, starting with Navistar. I've uh, worked at a dealership and I've been uh, here at Ritchie Brothers for the last six years. So uh, specializing in transportation, tractors, medium duty, trailers, um, uh, looking at uh, equipment in terms of uh, what, what we anticipate getting for uh, value. Um, so look forward to uh, speaking today. Tyler? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tyler Townsend and I'm the Director of Strategic Accounts for the transportation business. Um, I recently joined Ritchie last May of uh, 2020 during the, the, I guess, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I've been in the transportation business since 1987 where I started in the great state of Maine as a rental and leasing manager for a local truck dealer, and then uh, was a factory rep out in, I uh, got moved from Maine to California back in 89, and then spent some time out there. Uh, and then my last uh, 23 years, I was in the banking industry with the, and doing asset management. So, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking about the, the how the market's going and, and everything that we're seeing in today's uh, business. Don? Hi, thanks, Tyler. My name is Don Nash. I'm a territory manager with Ritchie Brothers. Uh, I've been with them. Uh, this is my 11th year. I handle some of our larger accounts um, for the uh, for the company. I also uh, help out most of our, uh, especially our Western uh, territory managers, my colleagues and stuff like that when it comes to looking at truck packages and, and, and the like. Um, as a lot of people know, Ritchie Brothers, if you were on the panel earlier or saw the panel earlier, we are uh, well known for the construction space and getting much better known in the transportation space, um, uh, both internally and externally. So I, I spend a lot of time uh, outside of just managing the, uh, the accounts that I have, um, working with our uh, colleagues, uh, my colleagues on uh, on reviewing trucks and market conditions and et cetera, 
as well as uh, with Rob and Tyler um, with uh, with pricing and and uh, and market conditions as well. So with that, uh, we'll hand it back over to uh, our MC. All right, guys, thank you very much. Tyler, your move from uh, Maine to California was like mine from Boston to California. Man, uh, I never wanted to go back after that. Uh, uh, anyway, here's how the format's going to work today. We 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 prep some some content. Uh, we're going to let these guys talk at you for a little bit. But uh, you know, if you could, you know, or we encourage you while they're speaking, you know, just text in or chat in your uh, your questions. We've got folks standing by, live operators standing by, if you will, who will uh, who will relay the questions and we'll work them in if we can while we're talking. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, uh, we'll try to hit them at the end. Uh, so first up, let's uh, let's talk about Class Eight trucks and how did they perform in 2020. Steve, you want to kick us off here uh, and just talk about some of the stuff you're seeing in the market. Sure, will Matt. Um, for those of you who don't know Act Research, we follow both the new truck side of the business as well as the used truck side. So what you're looking here uh, is kind of a sales history. Uh, the bars at the bottom that are sticking up are the new truck sales. The line running across the top is what our best estimate is of what has happened in the used truck market. Uh, I would tell you there is not a, a source out there that can tell us definitively what that market is. And so those are those are our, our best estimates uh, based on what we see in the place. And Matt, you know, the short answer to your question is 2020 was a heck of a lot better than anybody thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, you can see 2019 on the used truck side was a little bit soft. We were actually expecting a pretty hefty decline going into 2020. And that was pre-COVID, right? That was before COVID even reared its ugly head. And the reason for that is just because the industry put so much equipment out into the fleet uh, during that 2018 and 2019 timeframe, we really just needed a cooling off period. So you can see on the new truck side, we did see that step down. Uh, new truck buyers kind of stepped back a little bit. A lot of that because of COVID, right? You remember the factory was shut down for a yep. while, couldn't get trucks. Um, some of the some of the states, some of the dealerships were actually closed for a period of time during COVID. So again, uh, just not much in the way of uh, availability, at least as it usually runs. And so, you know, when that happens, uh, Oftentimes, buyers will look to the secondary market, to the used truck market, as a substitute for that new equipment that they can't get. And that's exactly what we saw happen in 2020. Interestingly, this graphic that you're looking at here, uh, very, uh, very uh, diametrically opposed numbers. On the left hand side, um, we, we track the number, well, we don't, but uh, you see in the Wall Street Journal, they reported the number of trucking companies that went out of business in 2020. Um, the second quarter of 2020 was saw the most trucking companies leave the industry that that we've seen in the history of of trucking, uh, which is a, a pretty significant number. Um, the the full year, I think 2020 ended up being maybe third or fourth in terms of the the most number of trucks that that left. So not a record year, but still a significant number of folks, um, you know, said goodbye to us. On the flip side, you know, you look at that article out of heavy duty trucking and we also had more new comp new trucking companies start up, right? Get operating authority during the year than we've ever had in the history of the industry. I would suggest that the folks that came into the industry, two things were happening as capacity kind of tightened up as those trucks were going out of business, as those truckers were parking their rigs, freight continued to grow. You and I as consumers, we didn't stop spending during COVID. We didn't spend on you know, concerts and, and NASCAR races and stuff like that, but we all went out and renovated our decks and put in pools and did all those home improvement projects that uh, have been on our list for a long time. So we spent a ton of money and generated an awful lot of freight that needed trucks to haul it. So there you go, they were seduced by those rates, but used trucks and I'll turn it over to Rob to tell you a little yeah. bit more about specifically what they were buying. So and we, we saw that, Rob, we saw that big time, right? In in pricing and, and the stuff that was in the stuff that was moving, uh, I assume. Yeah, so um, 
so really starting off with 2019, 2019 was a record setting year uh, at Ritchie Brothers uh, in terms of uh, uh, sales. We followed 2019 up with another back to back record setting year with uh, looking at just the last 15 model years of units, uh, 2006 model year and newer. We sold uh, almost 21,000 pieces for almost uh, just over $400 million. And, and again, that was uh, record setting for us. We did that on, on uh, five different platforms uh, being live, what we would call live. I mean, after, after March, we really didn't see any true yeah. live auctions with any of our sales, but uh, um, we did it. Uh, we already had an online platform set up to to take care of that. So so when COVID hit, we were we were well prepared for that, and uh, sales really did do uh, probably better than we expected. Um, COVID was a scary time, not knowing how how the how the public was going to react to it, but uh, the the numbers were there, and we sold uh, uh, record setting record setting numbers. Free line being number enough. one. Sorry yeah. about that. No, no, no. I think what's interesting too is when you talk about the numbers and the and the just the types of people that were coming in, right? With online, you mentioned online, right? We we saw you know a, a new class of buyer, right, coming to buy these trucks, and it, and it starts to show up in some of the models and the pricing and 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 that sort of thing that we're seeing in in uh, in twenty 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 with the with the with the onset of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think you get a combination of dealers that don't have the equipment that are buying equipment. And then we're, we're now getting into these smaller fleets, these, uh, you know, one to five truck buyers that are coming in and, and, and taking advantage of what we have to offer. I mean, the, the equipment that we sell is well recognized uh, fleets like Penske and Walmart. And um, that word is getting out there and, and the customers are really uh, getting behind it. And we're starting to see uh, high levels of retail buyers at our sales, uh, much more than in the past. Yeah, I think um, I think that's you know as we segue here a little, you know, when when the shift online happened, uh, as well as some of the other technology that's that's. I mean, well, look, we saw this in 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 uh, other channels as well, right? We saw more an acceleration of e-commerce in the last year that people were were predicting was going to take you know five maybe ten years, and so. You know, I think that brought a new a new type of buyer to to the auctions. Obviously, you know, as you guys were talking about, that e-commerce had had another impact, right? You know, you know, Steve, more deliveries, right? And you know, different types of companies delivering trucks and so forth. And so, I think what's what's interesting there is you had this kind of perfect storm. And and I guess Tyler, you know, we saw that play out a little bit on the trailer side as well, right? Yeah, um, as we mentioned, as Robbie mentioned about the increase in sales, overall trailers did great year over year based on the gross transaction value as well as total units sold. Um, you know, the kind of the above does show, illustrate that um, the increase in van trailers from 19 to 20 as well, other trailer types did great um, over the year based on total sold. But, you know, van trailers kept growing year over year from 18 to 19. And again, from 19 to 20, they doubled. So van trailers saw a, a huge increase and great trending. Um, and most majority of those did sell through the um, the, the RBA live sale. Um, and then also when you look at the late right now, currently late model dry vans are hard to come by. Um, so if you, you know, if, if we've been trying, we've been looking for packages um, throughout the marketplace and, and it's a, a, a hard find. So there, what that's done is it's increased the value of the, um, the you know, that mid-range, mid-aged unit, which is as well increased in value just in, over the last few months. And and Don, maybe you can chime in here. You know, what, what you know, what, what are you seeing when it, when it comes to, to this side of the market? Well, in the, as uh, Tyler was talking about, the demand on van trailers uh, right now uh, has just exploded. And a, a lot of that's contributed to um, OEM backups and the lead time necessary to to get the new ones. So you've got a lot of uh, mid-sized uh, companies that are and smaller ones too that are turning quickly to the used trailer market to try to expand on that uh, uh, market or that section of the market that was left vacant by the, the number of bankruptcies that we saw last year and the people that exited the market that Steve was talking about. 
um, that freight uh, didn't stop moving. Um, it still needed to go from point A to point B. So what that created was a was a, a vacuum where we had to have uh, you know, that picked up by smaller uh, and sometimes medium sized uh, freight handlers, and that created the demand for more trailers. And what I've seen in the market with uh, a lot of the customers that are out there that I deal with on a daily basis. Is, is that they've gone to a higher ratio of those van trailers to power units right now. Because again, power units are, are hard to get and they're very expensive to, to procure if you can find them, even in the used market. Um, so what they've done is just picked up the number of uh, van assets that they're, that they're running. So, and those, again, that, that medium size, that medium range trailer uh, in value has, has really escalated, especially over the last uh, 90 days or so, seeing much of that. So, um, a lot of the other uh, van trailers that we see, so reefer units and stuff like that, they're starting to pick back up a little bit. Um, they're not as explosive as the draw van market has been, at least from what I'm seeing. Um, a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, restaurant industry and stuff like that, and, and, and transport of prepared mm -hmm. foods, especially in last mile stuff like that. But, uh, but nothing is compared to the van trailer side that uh, that I've seen. It's it's uh, it's it's quite astonishing to see the value of a trailer. Quite literally, double in the in inside six months sometimes. Right. And you know, one of the things we we've, we've started to do lately is we're we're taking a lot of this pricing data. You know, we're working with a bunch of people both internally and externally. And this is just, you know, this is this is uh the the our price indices from our you know Richie Brothers you know market trends report. And you can see, you know, we were in this kind of deflationary you know, fall and then all of a sudden, boom, uh, we've just been, you know, rocketing forward, right? In 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 this sort of, you know, this pricing situation. Steve, we're we're you're seeing this all around, right? I mean, this is this is not just, you know, an auction. I mean, you are you're, you're you're seeing the same thing everywhere, right? Absolutely, Matt. It doesn't really matter what metric you're looking at, whether it be new truck orders or sales, spot freight rates, contract freight rates, everything that we're looking at seems to have this same curve. And it's it's that capacity tightening that I was talking about, right? It's 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 simple supply and demand. Uh, and so, you know, it's I think that bodes very well for the uh, for the for the used truck market. Uh, certainly in the first half of this year, things might cool off, uh, you know, if we kind of get an equilibrium going in terms of equipment. But yeah, we, uh, you know, we we are not holding back at this point as, a, as, a, as an industry or as an economy. It's just uh, floodgates open wide. And now, you know, over the weekend, we just got, you know, another 1.9 trillion yeah. dollars yeah. worth of uh, worth of liquidity injected into the economy so <laughs> i mean you know interesting. i bet i know what's going to happen with all that money it's going to get spent and most of it's going to generate freight so the good times are going to roll for a bit yeah yeah no i'm we where we've seen it you know on our side is just in the in the technology right a lot of people you know if you look at truck tractors on 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 you know kind of our through our auctions it's our most popular category, right? Gets the most bids, uh, uh, new bidders, uh, end user bidders, you know, all people who are using the app and bidding online, you know, for these assets. And I think that's that's helping to that's helping to drive prices here. Um, yeah, and it's you know that's been a bit of a change too as we went through that 2000 time frame. If you think back to the beginning of last year, the industry was oversupplied with aerodynamic sleepers. You couldn't give them away. Um, and you know as as freight grew and, and folks wanted to get in there and start hauling freight, that's exactly the equipment that they went after. Um, it was kind of the opposite with the day cabs, right? Day cabs were bringing top dollar in the in the space a year ago, and they're still doing well. But you know, if you look at the growth and the change, it's all it's all been focused on the on the truck tractors, no doubt. Are we seeing anything, uh, guys? Any any difference here? You know, Rob, Don, Tyler. You know, Kit, you know, and, and you know, RV. We're we're Canadian, right? Uh, you know, we seen anything different between Canada and, and the U.S. when it when it comes to trucks, or is it pretty much the same? I would not. I would not say it's the same. I would say that uh, the U.S. is performing uh, um, better right now than what Canada is in terms of what we're collecting in equipment, and I would say that the market. Let's just 
talk about the spot rate market for a second. Uh, from what I've heard, and I haven't followed it, I haven't seen the numbers exactly, but I've talked to some people in Canada, and the fleets are not seeing the same type of spot rates that we're seeing here in the U.S. Spot rates have jumped up dramatically to the point where they're exceeding where 2018 was in spot rates, and that was you know, some of the some of the best spot rates we've seen. Those numbers have jumped up dramatically from let's just say June, um, you know, through through the end of the uh, through the beginning of this month. Um, when I say dramatically, I'm talking about um, 50 cents or more per mile. But they're not seeing that in Canada mm. at this point. All right. So, kind of a question. So. You know, there's the proverbial crystal ball. Is this boom going to end? I mean, you know, Steve, you just talked about, you know, we just passed another one point nine uh, million dollars or a million trillion and 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 stimulus. And that's going to go to, you know, people who are, you know, it's going to be money in their pocket. They're going to be buying things. Do I should I expect the uh, uh, the truck traffic on my street to continue to build as those packages roll into the houses? Matt, I think that is a reasonable expectation. We, uh, you know, we're we're lousy with economists here at ACT Research. We've, uh, I think we've got four classically trained economists and uh, one that wants to play an economist on TV. So, and I'm neither one of those, by the way. Yeah. Um, what I would tell you is that the forecast that we've got in place right now with respect to growth in freight uh, suggest that this boom is going to continue uh, well into 2022. It's probably going to be, yeah, maybe fourth quarter of 22 before the the growth rate actually slows down uh, to something that is going to get people's attention. But between now and then, uh, you know, the floodgates seem to be open and people are just buying like crazy. On the new truck side of the business, we're going. I think we're going to have trouble keeping up with demand. Uh, which again is one of the things that makes us, uh, you know, pretty positive about the secondary equipment uh, and that market. The challenge, of course, is going to be, you know, we're already looking at tight inventory in this space, uh, so we're going to have to work pretty hard to uh, to beat the bushes and and have, have units available for 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 the used truck buyers. Got it. Got it. All right, let's. Um, this is what is we were we were putting together this this panel. Um, talk to me about some of the, uh, you know, if you guys could talk about what are, what are some of the, you know, as you look at the types, the features, you know, day cab versus sleeper. I, you know, I was a little bit, you know, once again, I'm an online guy. I'm not a truck guy. Uh, you know, manual. I mean, auto automatic transmissions versus manual. What impacts are those having on? on you know as well as safety features on, on pricing and trends what, what do you what do you guys see in there this is rob um, so looking at automated transmissions that is um with the with the driver shortage out there we're trying uh, fleets are trying to find the easiest way to get people into equipment and put them on the road and automated transmissions uh do just that they really uh shorten the learning curve on on taking someone from never driving the truck to putting them on the road uh, in the shortest period of time. It does all the upshifting and downshifting for you. I mean, I've uh, I've heard fleets tell me when I'm calling on them, I can turn a bad boy into a truck driver in two weeks. And I don't know if it's that simple, but he was trying to talk about the importance of, of the automated transmission. And if you look at what's going on out there, you know, uh, OEMs, um, you know, some months are over 85% automated right now. I talked to one dealership um, that they ordered one manual last year and it was because of a mistake they made. <laughs> so, you know, 199.9% of the equipment that they sold was automated. And that was one, one specific uh, uh, OEM dealership. So it's it's a big thing out there. The other thing I would say from a safety standpoint, you mentioned um, avoid, um, collision avoidance systems. I think those are going to become much more pop popular and, and we're going to, with the cost of insurance, uh, these collision avoidance systems are bringing down the, the, the high cost of insurance. Oh, 
Do we get lost? No, it looks like it well, it looks like it froze up. Yeah, Rob froze up. I'll jump in. I, yeah, I was gonna say because you know the thing that this this slide that we have here on the used truck sales and the the transmissions that that it's going to be changed over the next probably four or five years based on just the fact of the growth of the automatic and the the uh, AMT transmission, um, you know which you know you look at the vocational and that's primarily gone to the auto just because of the um, the operation effectiveness and then you know the fuel economy some of the other factors that they're looking at for. Um, and then driver availability, as Rob had mentioned, you know, from the safety feature, you know, you got the, as you'd mentioned, the active brake assist, you got the uh, the cruise control, some of the features that you're seeing in your cars are now coming in these trucks um, to, to, to make it a lot safer um, operation. Yeah. Hey, this is Don. I was going to pick up on that, uh, just kind of tying it back to some of those uh, bankruptcies that we saw last year, a lot of the smaller ones. Um, and a few that I worked myself as uh, as with Richie Brothers, my job was forced out of the industry simply because of insurance rates. They couldn't afford the increase of the insurance rate, and it's kind of a catch twenty two for the smaller fleets. They need these newer trucks with the with the latest, greatest collision avoidance and safety uh, systems on it uh, in order to get the lower rates from the uh, from their insurance companies. Um, but then, in the same hand, they can't necessarily afford that one hundred and forty, hundred and fifty thousand dollar truck. Um, uh, per unit to replace their fleet to, to get there. So a lot of those uh, smaller fleets that were put out of business that, that I saw last year were uh, were simply because of that. Um, and so, and then the other uh, point I was gonna make on that about this day cab uh, versus the uh, sleeper cab is that that Steve had brought up earlier was that we have seen such a, an escalation in price on the, on the sleeper cab trucks um, you know that's uh, that's highly unusual, as, as Steve had pointed out. We there was points in history where you couldn't give a sleeper cab truck away um, after its uh, first round service life, uh, and now you you can't find enough of them to sell. Uh, but what has happened? What what we have seen? What I'm seeing now, and I, and I think will continue in the market as this as this trend continues until the OEMs catch up on the man, on the delivery of some of these newer units has been that a lot of these trucking companies are now pivoting towards the day cabs just to make sure that they can all the trailers that they've got and the loads that they can capitalize on right now to to uh, to make their dollar uh, keep running. And so the the availability of the day cabs aren't aren't quite as uh, dire as it is in the sleeper cab market. And we've seen that uh, from a price standpoint and availability standpoint where the prices are starting to go up. Um, and the demand is starting to rise with them and the inventory is starting to trickle down on those day cab units. So just simple law of, of uh, economics going in effect there. But um, that's kind of what we're seeing in the day cab versus the sleeper market um, in, in the Ritchie Brothers world that I'm that I'm living in. So. That's, uh, you know, interesting that, you know, once again, you know, I never the, the whole the whole insurance angle is, is pretty cool there. One other angle and, and we I switched to the side. We got a question on, you know, something similar coming in here. You know what's what's going on with 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 diesel prices? How's that gonna how's that gonna impact truck sales? And you know what are we seeing? Right? Uh, you know I forget the 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 you know which which electronic truck company went public lately at some ridiculous valuation. But what are we seeing? Uh, you know as far as uh, electronic vehicles go for uh, for the for the truck space. I'll jump in on this one. I'm not afraid. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, um, yeah, with respect to the diesel prices, um, you know, it's it's interesting, an interesting question. Uh, the late model used equipment that we have available to us is some of the most fuel efficient equipment that has ever existed. It's actually one of the things that's spurring on demand on the new truck side. So we're happy to see it starting to filter its way into the secondary market. That's just going to make operations for used truck buyers hopefully that much more profitable. Um, you know, in terms of is it going to change sales? Yeah, it might change the composition of what they're what they're what the used truck buyer is interested in buying, but I don't think it's going to make a, a difference in total. And you know, never forget that you got a uh, you got a great picture of some nice long and tall rigs there. There is a, you know, there's a contingent of used truck buyer that they're not concerned about fuel economy. There are other things that are priorities for them. And the look of that truck, regardless of how many miles per gallon it gets. Uh, is going to trump every time that that used truck purchase. So 
Uh, that's the, that's what I'd say about that. Let me let me go ahead and answer the question about electric truck sales, and maybe some of the other guys can chime in about their thoughts on on diesel prices and what's happening there. Um, first off, let's 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 make this real, okay? There are probably only I'll say not more than three thousand commercial vehicles that are electric that are in operation today in the United States. Most of those down in light duty, and actually probably more than half of them are school buses. As far as the as far as class eight trucks, you know, right now it is um, it's a pipe dream. It's something that is looks really cool, but if you do the math, it just doesn't work. The capabilities of the battery technology today in the class eight world, and I'm talking long haul freight here, okay, uh, just don't work. We may get there. There are other niches in the class eight world where it makes a heck of a lot of sense and we're starting to see some movement and interest there. So if you think about uh, vocational vehicles, things like yard spotters, for example, or refuse trucks maybe, um, those, those are gonna make a lot more sense sooner than, than your over the road trucks are gonna make. So stay tuned on that front you know first first we got to get them then we got to have them on the news side and then they'll find their way into the secondary market so you're looking at a few years down the road before uh before that becomes a real thing for the used truck buyer so uh no elon musk podcast anytime soon got it <laughs> got it <laughs> you know back to the the fuel question ultimately you know the uh the pro projections were that for 2021 would be $2.71 per gallon and then $2.74 in 2022. Um, I don't know. I mean, right now, I think we've exceeded that this year for fuel. So I don't know that how that's going to hold. But, you know, the pre-emission units that um, came into the market uh, previous that, you know, the gliders are pretty much gone to this, gone to the way, wayside based on the phase two uh, emissions and so that they're you know, the, they're no longer really, a lot of manufacturers have stepped out of that arena. Uh, you know, the, there was a study that was done that a, a 10,000 glider trucks emission greenhouse gases equal to about 200,000 new trucks. So, you know, um, I think going forward and then pre-emission being an older, much older truck is, are generally hard to find in good condition, good resellable condition, operating condition. So speaking, so so we're not we're not going to see the uh, uh, electronic trucks anytime soon. But uh, you know, when I was uh, driving over here in Sweden, uh, I was watching these guys mow this hill, and they were controlling this uh, lawnmower, this kind of large, kind of you know, completely by remote control. So what what about what about the self driving stuff? What do you guys? Uh, we got a question from the uh, from the audience on on this one. Are we seeing anything in the or is is the autonomous driving uh, a pipe dream as well. Uh, you know, I think you could characterize it, Matt, in a similar fashion. It, it's certainly a technology that is in development. You know, if you think about the safety technology that we talked about in some of the earlier pricing conversations, automated emergency braking, you know, the lane departure warning and keeping, all that kind of stuff, those are the technological building blocks of ultimately full autonomy if we can achieve it. So we're making progress in that direction, but there's, you know, we're such a litigious society here in the, in the US. We've got to get all of that through the lawmakers. You know, we've got to get it through the insurance companies. Um, so there's, there's still, a, again, a tremendous amount of work out there ahead of us that has to be done before, you know, it becomes a, a mainstream reality. Now, there are autonomous trucks, you know, delivering freight today. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the technology isn't or won't work. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing it right now, but they're doing it under conditions that, you know, are sort of provisionary, I guess, is the way to think about that. So, um, I, if you think about the most expensive line item in a trucking company's, uh, you know, operating budget, it's it's labor, right? It's the driver, and so if you can find a way to reduce that cost, there's a huge incentive to do that. You know, whether we actually are able to make that happen or not depends on how how things roll. So we'll see. Speaking of speaking of labor. Um, you know, obviously we talked a little bit before about the, you know, automatic versus manual transmission and what that's kind of opened up as far as getting drivers on the road. 
what the what about the complexity of the vehicles themselves you know we were talking on the construction panel earlier uh that you know hey on the construction side one of the biggest shortages is labor service labor right people to fix this stuff we seeing that here on the on, on the truck side as well i'm happy to comment unless somebody wants to jump in first so here's here's the way we characterize that, right? We uh, we all know there's a driver shortage. I, I don't think a day goes by that we don't see a headline on that. The funny thing is, is that the tech technician shortage is actually more acute than the driver shortage, and that's for diesel mechanics. They're having a harder time now finding diesel mechanics than they are uh, finding well than they ever have one and two than they are having uh, trying to find find drivers and so yeah it is a it is a big deal and boy you know you combine the two of those right if we need uh, uh, technicians who are going to be able to work on electric or autonomous trucks yeah. <laughs> that 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 technician doesn't exist today <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, very much. Yeah. we have lots of lots of job security in this industry and lots of fun coming down the road at us I, yeah, I mean, that's that, you know, I, I've learned so much since, you know, you know, making the switch uh, over to RB. Let's get back. I don't know if we got Rob back, uh, but, you know, I know his answer to this question. If he's back, you know, what's what's the when is the right time to sell? What's the optimal age and mileage? Uh, you know, uh, if Rob, if you're not back, maybe Tyler, no. and Don, you can pick this up. No, I'm back. Um, I, you know. The right time is right now. I mean, we have <laughs> I seen. Do that answer. Good answer. You hear me? Yeah. All right. So we have seen record-breaking uh, numbers that we're achieving. You know, even when you look at back at Q4, and I was looking at numbers on what we achieved in Q4, we thought we were getting really good numbers in Q4, um, substantially better than Q4 of 2019. When you look at year over year, year over year sales, I mean, numbers were up about 35% comparing a five year old or a six year old or a seven year old versus the next year on. Um, we're collecting another five to ten thousand dollars over and above what we we're collecting in uh, q4 of 2020 on the same age unit so not only things were up you know in, at the end of q uh, at the end of 2020 but they've even gotten better so you know it's not surprising for us to see uh, a 2016 freightliner for example selling between you know with 600,000 miles on it plus or minus going for high 30s low 40s uh, we're, we're seeing it every day uh, so right now is is a great market it, it's what i would call a, a seller's market right now in, in a question we got uh rob or maybe someone else can answer this is the question we got uh from from the audience you know kind of back to the us versus canada thing are, are we seeing are, are we seeing any any purchases in the us and then people taking it over the border uh, I think that's, uh, you know, what, what I'm seeing here is, is it, is it easy to, you know, take this stuff, uh, take this stuff across the border? Hey, this is Don, I can jump in it because I've given some thought about that. And we've actually, we did a little bit of that with a couple of the bankruptcies we had last year, but it was actually mostly focused on trailer assets. Um, it, that's a rare occurrence where we see something that exits the United States going into the Canada, going into Canada on the secondary market. We see much more of it coming back the other direction. And a lot of that has to do with just the uh, the currency exchange between the two countries, right? You get you get about a 30% premium going into the Canada, but you also get about a 30% discount coming back out of Canada into the United States. So that uh, going you know from here to there um, doesn't make a lot of sense because they're paying a lot more money for it. Um, and also, as we discussed earlier, the availability of the trucks is not, um, not conditioned as it is in the United States. The demand is not quite as strong. It has risen, there's no doubt about that, but the demand for it, um, the feeding frenzy that's going on in, in the market here in the United States is not that in Canada. That would drive the necessity to import that equipment at that premium uh, into it. I've had those discussions actually last week and the week before with a couple of our uh, customers that were up there. They were actually looking at trucks that were down here uh, because they were looking for some newer ones and we're just uh, kind of uh, oblivious to what was happening with the market inside the United States. And when I gave him a taste of 
of how the trucks are performing today versus that same age truck last year. Some of the information that Rob had just shared, um, it was a it was a quick uh, note. I'll wait on get my new truck from my uh, dealership up here and instead of having to pay almost the exact same money for a three or four year old truck with you know three or four hundred thousand miles on it to get it in. So uh, that's that's kind of what we see on on the Canada US uh, back and forth on the export. And interest. Interesting. Let's um, you know, so so one of the things, uh, you know, we've as we've been flipping through the slides here, you've seen a lot of charts and graphs and and, uh, you know, I think one of the more interesting things uh, about this space is just the rising importance of uh, data and the tools which surface that data to help you make decisions like we're providing, you know, I know from the RB side, uh, we're providing tons of new tools, whether it's RB Asset Solutions, whether it's RB Asset Valuator. You know, we just acquired a company called Rouse. Uh, they are a, a company uh, focused on data. Obviously, the the ACT folks here, you know, putting out data. I, who wants to, you know, how is this, how is all this data floating around, you know, changing the lives of fleet owners and dealers and so forth when it comes to making decisions about buying and selling trucks. I can jump in that as well and then let Steve or, or Rob jump over and, and to, to finish that up or Tyler. Um, you know, with with the data, it's, it's the industry nowadays, it's almost a, the larger fleets particularly are super data driven, I guess to, to put <laughs> not too ter technical of a term on it. They hardly make any sort of decision without the data to back it up. Uh, and that comes down to when they disposition their their trucks and decommission and deplete. Um, you know, what what they look at is is what the cost of ownership is over time. When does that start to escalate and when does that pencil back against the purchase of a new truck when you're still got that under warranty and get a lot of that extra work taken care of through the uh, through the dealerships. Um, one of the great tools that we have is uh, as in Ritchie Brothers is, is to be able to see these types of uh, data points in kind of real time. We're almost a canary in the coal mine, um, as Rob can attest to with the data that he keeps track of in his models, um, is that, you know, we, we had an auction here in Phoenix last week and we had, uh, you know, Houston and, and Fort Worth before that in, in the preceding weeks. That's a very good indicator of what the market is doing uh, because it's a live auction. It's, uh, it's, we've got, I think we had 7,000 plus uh, registrant bidders at the at the Phoenix site. Um, so that gives you a very good snapshot of what's going on in the market at that moment for that day for those people. Um, and taking on the aggregate over a, a several weeks, it gives you a great indication of, of where the market's going, where it's in house performing. And one of the tools that we have for that that we use internally as well as now being available to the public is RB Asset Evaluator. Uh, you can go to rbassetsolutions.com and, and, and check that out. But it can give you some price points by just putting a few pieces of, of information in about the particular truck that you're interested in or a particular type of manufacturer. And you can uh, use the, uh, the the margin to uh, dial in exactly what you're looking for. But it really does give you a real time uh, look of what the market is doing and how that is performing to help you as a fleet owner uh, or a fleet manager guide the decision about what uh, we need to sell and when we need to sell it. So those types of decisions are highly data based in, in the environments from the big fleets like you know Penske and Swift Knight um, or Knight Swift, sorry, all the way down to the to the little guys that are you know ten or fifteen unit trucking companies um, because the, the the largest uh, piece of equipment or the largest expense that they have outside of the, the labor cost is is their trucks and they get a return on that when they sell it. So they want to make sure they're doing that at the right time for the right amount of money. So I'll turn it over to either Steve or, or Tyler or, uh, or Rob to speak a little bit more about it if they want. Well, just the, you know, really quick, the data that I use daily is the same data that's on that website. So everything that I import into my pricing models are the same data that I'm taking uh, off the, what you see daily. So when, when there's an update that's sent out to our website that shows what Phoenix just uh, achieved in terms of uh, sales that's the same thing that's going in my model and it's helping me make decisions on what we're doing from a pricing standpoint going forward um you know and there's what two and a half years of data i think you can uh you can pull up um so that that's phenomenal stuff to 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 look at what's going on in the market and really you can go back and say where were we this time last year 
you know, look at some of that data and see how the market has changed, and you'll see that it's improved dramatically. You know, I was going to comment. Um, Don kind of kind of stole my thunder a little bit. He was he was on a good Sorry. track, and then he was talking about how you know the large fleets are are let's say sophisticated enough that they're using all this data uh, to you know to leverage uh, and and make their companies as strong as they can. And I was going to suggest that you know we're seeing that filter down. It's not just the large guys, but we're increasingly seeing smaller and smaller fleets become more and more sophisticated. But Don said that already, so dag on you, Don. <laughs> um, the one other thought, I guess, that I would add on to this is that as as the amount of data that's out there continues to increase, there's just nothing uh, left that's not being scrutinized. I guess I probably shouldn't say that. I'm sure there are things, but they, you know, the big as well as the small are digging deeper and deeper into the granularity of the data and trying to figure out, you know, how can I, how can I take advantage of this and, and, you know, improve my position, improve my performance, uh, buy equipment at better prices, sell at better prices, whatever the case may be. You see uh, on the slide there, they've got our freight forecast. Um, you know, we're forecasting freight and freight rates. So as carriers are looking to negotiate contracts, you know, that becomes a tool that helps inform, you know, what should we be charging for our services? It, it just doesn't end there. And that's that's the great thing about it, I guess, from my perspective. Yeah, we got a question up there about the, you know, people see the Rouse name as well. Rouse was um, is a company that that Ritchie Brothers recently acquired and and they are a data company. I mean, that is their that is their, you know, they, they do a lot of data on equipment pricing across a, a number of sectors and they offer you know, services related that data. You know, one of the things they allow you to do is if you're, you know, they, they price data, they, they basically every single night they're looking at roughly $65 billion worth of equipment. Uh, and then they provide tools and services, you know, much like we do through RB Asset Solutions to help people price and sell uh, that equipment. So price and sell trucks, they offer tools to run your own website, uh, they provide appraisals uh, and so forth. So once again, I mean, we, you know, as, as Ritchie Brothers, right, we saw this trend as well and, and, you know, hey, how can we do a better job of, of you know, providing that pricing information. You know, that same stuff that Rob gets, right? You know, every night that he's talking about going into his models, you know, we want to make available to, to the industry uh, as a whole. Um, so as we go into Q&A, you know, just a, another a question that, that's come across and, and uh, I'll let some folks fight it out. I might even join the fight. You know, what's the you know, what's the best way to sell trucks, right? Is it auction? Is it live auction? Is it online auction? Is it, is it, you know, you know, marketplace is your own retail, you know, what's, what's the, what's the best channel? Uh, I've got, I've got my view, but uh, I'll, 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 I'll throw it out to you guys to start with. Yeah, I wouldn't mind jumping in first on that one because Matt Ackley and myself have had these discussions uh, <laughs> a little bit before. So, uh, um, you know, myself, I'm, I'm, I've came into this industry, Don the Wool, Bleed Orange, Live Auction with Ritchie Brothers. And um, if you would have asked me this 14 months ago, even 16 months ago, I said that that would still be my belief that you're going to get some of the stronger results on most assets through the Live Auction. Um, what this past year has has really taught me personally, but also Ritchie Brothers a, a, as, as a series of companies, including our planet, is that 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 mantra no real, doesn't really hold true anymore. Um, we we offer three different distinct platforms in, in which to sell your equipment, that being um, through the live auction uh, being the major one. And then we've got uh, Iron Planet, which has got two different flavors. You've got a, a weekly auction, which is very similar to what we do in our live environment, um, as well as what we call our Marketplace E platform, which is a, a kind of a make offer buy now. Uh, if anybody that's familiar with eBay, that's kind of the same the same type of process. And what we have seen, I have seen with no matter which channel I'm selling or recommending to sell that equipment on, the price parity on it is very, very strong now. Uh, and that I think has a lot to do with the uh, just the overall paradigm change in, in buying dynamics of the of, uh, of the past year with COVID. 
Um, and um, and it also speaks to the uh, trust that uh, that has been developed over that past year in the online platforms, of course, in the Ritchie Brothers and the Iron Planet names and the, the reliance that people have on that information that we put out there about the price points availability, but also what that truck is and what it is not. Um, so that's it's really it's really come around. So I, if I had to pick one now, I don't I don't know that I could. It would really come down to what uh, what is necessary for that particular uh, fleet or individual selling the truck. What are they trying to accomplish? Do they need the money immediately? Do they have to have a guaranteed sale by a certain date? Do they need to uh, achieve something that's like at a retail level that includes a warranty on it? All those types of things would change the answer on it. But as far as pricing parity across the three distinct platforms that we have right now, they're very, very close. And in a lot of instances, you have uh, you, you have the online, which is, I'm assuming, Matt's favorite, uh, outperform the stuff in the live auction. Again, it, it, there's some nuances to it, but across the board, the parity is there. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting, uh, Don. I mean, I think, you know, as, as you and I have kind of debated this, you know, over the years now, it, it's, you know, as I think, you know, I always like to say that, you know, RB had a dirt, you know, I came from, most people don't know, I came from the Iron Planet side, been an online guy my, my whole life. I was at the aforementioned uh, eBay uh, for a number of years. And, and um, you know, when I, you know, I, I like to talk about RB's dirty little secret, and that's even at a live sale, 70% of the purchases were were made online. And I think, what that really gets us to and, and don you spoke about flexibility is is it's just it, it's the needs of the seller right and i think you know you know when do you need cash do you need to store the truck i mean you know a lot of people have been asking us things like you know what are you going to do with your yards now that you know online has taken over are you going back to live bidding well, you know, I, I think, you know, our one of the things we're finding out is that, that you know, our, our yards are actually, uh, you know, they help us provide a lot of flexibility to sellers. If sellers need a, a place to store trucks, they can store them at our yards. And, and even if they're trying to sell them themselves, they can store them at our yards or, or, you know, the sale day, right? We allow people to come to the yards and inspect everything before the sale. We just do the sale online. So, you know, as we try to figure all this out, kind of live and online are almost words that, you know, we don't really even need to use anymore. It's, you know, just because there's the, so many of the, we, you know, there's just so many options out there to combine, you know, all the aspects of these, of these channels that, you know, our goal right now is to make sure we can provide, you know, the most flexible solutions so that, you know, our sellers can get cash when they need it, right, and get the price they need. All right. Well, we're uh, we're we've gone for a while now, uh, and uh, you know I used the word loquacious before. I'll use it again. I got to get it in here. I want to thank uh, uh, our loquacious panel for 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 helping us out today, and appreciate everybody's questions. and And we're gonna make uh, all this available online. We'll probably cut it up and snip it so you don't have to listen to me talk. Uh, but but anyway. Uh, really appreciate your time, folks. Uh, thank you again to the panel and, and everybody stay safe out there. Talk to you soon.